Good morning, everyone. I am Alina Burney. I'm 25 years old, and I'm a pre-registration pharmacist. Now, based on what I've just said, if I left some business cards lying around, how many of you would be willing to pick one up? Oh, so nice of you. So a few people putting their hands up. But I'm not surprised that not everyone is jumping up at the first chance to get to know me, because you don't know anything about me yet. We all have our stories, and you haven't heard mine. I've not given you anything to connect to. So for my story to begin, we go back 10 years. Now, the mathematicians in the room will have deduced that 10 years ago, I would have been 15. Points for that one. So when I was 15, I always felt like technology seemed to be on the up and up and up. So I really struggled with keeping up with like smartphones, my games, online, everything like that. And I actually became obsessed with it. I had my head down almost all the time. I used to go home after school, plug myself in, and I'd be connected. I, but I was not. I was not connected. Because for me, that little bubble that I'd created around me, that had my music, my games, my headphones, it kept everybody else on the outside and kept me safe, kept me calm, and it was easier to understand in real life. Because the games that I was playing, there was no game over. You just restart the game, start from a different save, just take it easy. Real life isn't like that. And I think somewhere along the way I forgot that. I became quite secluded. I became very comfortable with being in this bubble to the point where I was like, well, I could go to this event, I could go to this party, I could go to this thing my parents are trying to force me to go to, which I don't really want to go to, but I thought, no, I'll just stay in my room, in my safety, because my bubble was way more inviting than the cold, harsh life I saw outside. Something I began to really struggle with was criticism. Each bit of criticism that I got given by anyone, my peers, my parents, my teachers, felt like a brick being put in front of me. And that brick began to form a wall. That wall became something that I realized that there's no one removing the wall. This wall is just building, it's building, it's building. And I thought, let's just ignore it. This is, this is another thing I can just do and move away from. So each brick felt like I was secluding myself further. Each brick felt like I didn't really want to be around people because all I was getting was criticism, especially in your teens. And each brick felt like another thing I could ignore from the comfort of my bubble. It got to the point where I had become so secluded that I didn't really feel like I relied on anyone. I only liked me. I liked listening to myself. I wanted only my opinion on things, the games I liked, the music I liked, and the only person whose voice I could hear in the soundproof bubble I created was my own. And it wasn't until I was 17 years old where things really took a turn for the worse. And I was diagnosed with a juvenile form of arthritis. That, for me, was my body telling me, no one will get us. No one's going to understand what we're going through. You're 17, you're not going to be able to relate to anyone else because no one else is going to know what's going on in your life at this point now. And that downward spiral became so bad that you have to understand that the only person that can really pick you up from rock bottom is yourself. You can't expect anyone else to pick you up. And that's where I learned something around the topic of self-love. I felt like if no one else was going to take care of me, I had to be the one to do it for myself. So each brick that had been put in front of me, that little brick of criticism, I thought the first step has to be to remove these bricks. But I had no idea how. I didn't know where to begin. And that's where I physically went and looked at myself in the mirror, and I didn't recognize who I saw. I saw someone with dark circles in the eyes, face was a bit gaunt, not really any happiness or hope behind my eyes. And that's not who I was. I thought back to when I was nine years old and thought, what would a nine-year-old me think of me now? Why nine? Because at nine, I moved to this country. I moved from Pakistan to England, and 
that big change meant that something that I had to be able to do from quite an early age was to be able to start a conversation. And that, some, that for me became something I completely forgot how to do. I forgot how to connect with people in real life because my gaming life, my music life, everything that I did on my own was so much more comfortable. So I thought back to being nine years old, moving to this country, and how easy I found going up to people and just talking to them because I'm part of the Pakistani culture. Pakistanis as a culture, we're very community-centered. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is, my mom is currently away in Pakistan at the moment, but, and I'll be getting food sent to my house from loads of different people, and I don't have to go and just eat out, not once. <laughs> good thing, bad thing. Auntie Shane around the corner knows exactly what GCSE grades I was predicted, and which ones I got. <laughs> she knows what universities I applied to, and which ones rejected me. But I bet you she doesn't know which one I got into, because that's not something that they paid that much attention to. You know, that's where you get the criticism coming in, and that's all fine. But I was used to that. So somewhere along my teens, I lost that. And I realized that if these are the kind of principles, these are the kind of ways of speaking that I knew of, at the age of nine, what changed? And for me, the thing that changed was technology. I lost myself because I found it all so new, so interesting, and I became so hooked on it that I thought everything else, like I said, is just so much, you know, to take in. So I thought, I need to go back to essentially my roots and realize that that is something that's innate to me. Luckily, I was born into a culture that's so community-centered, where you're with people on a weekly basis, you're meeting up, you've got young children, you've got young adults, you've got the elders, and everyone required a different sense of interaction to be able to gauge and hold their interest. So how can someone that knew that at nine not know it at 17? Which is why I tried little bit by little bit, you have to be aware of different parts of your own personality. So for me, it was the fact that I had this massive wall that had been built up from criticism that caused me to keep up my guard. But that guard would come down if I just opened myself up a little bit, which is what I had to do. I had to force myself into situations where I felt like, let's see how this goes. So taking part in things at school, going around with my mom and dad to back to these events where I pretended that these ex events didn't exist. I just thought, no, I don't want to go there. I'm safe here. I'll just do my own thing. Going to those cultural events was probably the first step that I had to take to be able to think, oh, I'm comfortable here. And everything starts to come back a little bit. And that, for me, was the first step to find myself on this journey. So as it goes from there, I was in a situation where I can feel myself building up. And as that guard came down, I was building new relationships, strengthening old ones. And this slight personality refurbishment that I was giving myself led me to the point where I felt like I'm now able to network. The person that you see there, this is not who you would have seen today. In fact, you wouldn't have seen me today because there was not a chance I would be stood on a stage talking to a group of people who I don't know yet. That is not who I was, but this is luckily who I am now. And that kind of journey that you have to take starts with self-love. When you get to the point where you start to think about networking, networking is defined as the act or process of exchanging information to build professional and or social contacts. Let's break that down a little bit. Networking's in everything that you do. Networking is in getting a coffee, going to a Starbucks. If you just use that little bit of connection that you can have with someone, no matter how short-lived, you can practice the kind of skills that will make other situations, other settings of networking less nerve-wracking. If you're in the back of a taxi and you say, have you been busy tonight, mate? That little bit of short-lived connection will connect you to one person for a little bit of time, but it's still key to be able to prep yourself for what's to come. It's in after-school clubs, it's in group hobbies, it's 
doesn't have to be in just the professional world. I know networking is a word that we all associate with professions and businesses, but it's important for your social contacts as well. And that's something I didn't learn until very, very recently, probably during my university years. So for me, I kind of miss the days where the doorbell would ring, you'd run to the door to see who it was. Now you get a ping on your phone and it's your mate saying, can you let me in? Why does that have to happen? If they'd rang the doorbell, maybe my dad would have answered the door. They would have had an interaction with my dad and then you've got another connection forming and that's how you get your network. Because a network isn't just you. You and then rings of people around you. There should be connections between those people as well. My friends should be able to come over and then my parents interact with them. Then other friends come over, parents are interacting, other friend, family friends come over, you know, those kind of things. And that's how you build that network up because you need that support. And that was something that I didn't have at the time when I was 15 years old. You get to the age where you start to think, there's things that I know of that existed back in maybe my mom and dad's days that don't exist now. And I always think, oh, I wish, I wish they existed for me still. I wish people still sent letters. I know it's easier to send someone an email or a text, gets to them in seconds, but that text, you can't convey a lot in the text. A text won't show you the tone of voice they used, it won't show you the way they spoke. You have to have the normalcy of pauses to be able to understand what someone is trying to say, the tone of voice, to, that can't be replaced with the ellipses. That's not how these kind of things work. So. All of these things that I'm talking about, they might sound very simple, I'm not saying anything too groundbreaking, but the thing that I will say is that when you're on this kind of journey to be able to network, you don't want to be looking at networking, especially as a man's world. You don't want to walk into a sea of gray, blue and black and go, oh, there's, there's a lot of people here and oh, they're all, you know, and the men, and with men, the way they interact with each other is quite different to the way they'll interact with a woman. So if men are, you know, high-fiving or anything like that, I'm not saying go in there, you know, guns blazing, grab someone, that's not what I'm saying at all. But as a woman, know your worth, know what you can do with it. Go in there, interact with someone in a way where it's going to be meaningful to you and to them, and then make that connection, pass on a business card, and then move on to the next person. It's very easy to get comfortable and to cling on. It's very easy to go into a room, talk to one person, feel like, okay, I've done it now. I'll just go around with this person, see how it goes, and if it goes good, it goes good. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And that's not what you want to be doing. So the way I see it, when it comes to conversations, you need to be able to understand someone at face value face-to-face, -face, not just on text or, you know, in emails or anything like that. You have to be able to look at them in the eyes, know their body language, and give them eye contact and smile. These are things when you walk into a room that, de that will demand other people's attention. If you walk into a room where you're networking, eye contact, smiling, body language, these things are what people will be looking for to be able to give you the importance. So, out of the things I've said today, the kind of things I want people to be able to take away are threefold. Number one, it's all about focusing on the word human in the term human connection. Like I said, eye contact, body language, tones of voice, smiling. These are things that differentiate us from machines. Yeah, you can put an emoji in your text, but that's not the same as giving someone an actual physical smile. That's what they'll understand and what they'll see. Number two, you have to see this journey as a journey from connection, from conversation to connection. That's the main thing that you're doing today. You're going to be networking, you'll be talking to other people. You want to start a conversation that leads to a connection. And number three, you can't be your own worst critic or indeed have anyone critique you without also being your own biggest fan by having the tools and the resources within you of self-love to be able to move past those criticisms and become the person that you want to be. Thank you for listening.